Good evening, everyone. My name is Cindy Kraviak, and uh, I'm the Program and Outreach Coordinator at Peters Township Public Library here in McMurray, PA. This evening, we've got Tom McMillan, um, who wrote Flight 93, The Story, The Aftermath, and The Legacy of American Courage on 9-11. He's going to be sharing about us both. Just a few housekeeping things before Tom gets started. On your screen, there is a short three-question poll, if you don't mind taking a moment to answer that. The library would greatly appreciate it. In addition to that, everyone's camera and microphone are currently turned off. At the very end, whenever we go into our Q&A portion, we'll turn those back on in case anyone has a question to ask. You're more than welcome to utilize the chat feature while Mr. McMillan is presenting. Flight 93, the story of the aftermath and the legacy of American courage on 9-11 offers the most complete account of what actually took place on September 11th, 2001. From the plane's delay takeoff in Newark to the moment it plunged upside down into an open field in Somerset County, author Tom McMillan will guide participants through the events, aftermath, and the legacy of Flight 93. A lifelong student of the history of the Civil War, of history and civil war, Tom McMillan has had two other books published, Armistead and Hancock, Beyond the Legend of Two Friends and the Turning Point of the Civil War, and Gettysburg Rebels, Five Nation Sons Who Came Home to Fight as Confederate Soldiers, which has won a literary award. McMillan serves on the Board of Trustees of Pittsburgh's Heinz History Center and previously served on the Board of Directors of the Friends of Flight 93 National Memorial. He resides in Pittsburgh and recently retired after a 43-year career in sports media and communications. Tom, I'm going to turn my camera off and just let me know when you want me to switch slides. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. And thanks, everyone, for having me. We had a, a little glitch with the PowerPoint, so Sydney's going to run it for me. You know, just uh, so you, you'll hear me give her, her some directions. Um, but that's a, that's a big help. So thank you. <clears throat> Again, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's, Always an honor to speak about this story in this book, but especially uh, this week on the 20th anniversary of those uh, of the September 11th attacks that had such an impact on our country. You know, one thing I learned is that I was long, as she said, I'm a long, lifelong student of history. One thing I learned writing this book that I didn't expect was there's a challenge is there's a challenge to writing contemporary history. Most of history we think of things that happened hundreds of years ago. I, I wrote two books on Gettysburg and. I seriously doubt if any of you were alive during the Battle of Gettysburg, so you don't have any contemporary impressions of what happened. It's different in a story like this. So what you have is a battle between history and memory, history being what happened and memory being, I think I saw that on CNN, I read it on the internet, you, you, you have these impressions. And we also, as, as human beings, have short attention spans. If you're like me, uh, you were probably consumed all the media about September 11th for about seven to maybe 10 days after the attacks. Then September 20th or 21st, you move on because you have to get on with the rest of your life. One thing we, we know, however, that affects this is in journalism. And I learned this way long ago in my journalism uh, education days at Point Park University. Reporting in the in early and national tragedies is often flawed. It's not a criticism of the media, but the authorities don't even know what happened yet. They didn't, didn't know what happened on September 12th, 13th, 14th. They didn't know the full story. So snippets of stories are getting out there. You hear those early and they become part of the urban legend. And some of them are incorrect. They eventually get corrected. They've all been corrected, uh, but it takes weeks or months or sometimes years. But that's still in people's minds. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna start with three of those. Things you, if you've paid attention to this story at all, you've probably heard, if you're watching the documentaries that are already on the cable networks, you've probably seen this, uh, just to kind of get us started. One is that the hijacker's weapon of choice was a box cutter that was widely reported. Uh, I saw it in the documentary again last night. And I thought, even when that happened, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to be cut by a box cutter, but, but I found it difficult to believe you could hijack four planes with them. In fact, they, did, they didn't use them as their main weapons. They used knives. Uh, the FBI found at least nine receipts of uh, purchases of multi-wave tools, Leatherman multi-wave tools. You can still buy them at uh, Lowe's and Home Depot. They have 10 or 11 blades. They had, the hijackers had, had researched our system. They knew, as we didn't, or at least I didn't, in 2001, that it was legal to carry a knife blade of up to four inches on a plane. People say, how'd they get that on the plane? They walked, put them in their pockets and walked right on. The other 
The second one is that the passengers and crew made calls from cell phones. And that led to a lot of the conspiracy theories. You can't make a cell phone call from 35,000 feet. These calls must have been must have been made up. The truth is there were there were 37 calls made from Flight 93. There's one famous call, but 37 calls. Two of them were from cell phones. 35 of them were from air phones. Young people would have no idea what these are. They're video screens now. But here's an image of a, of a 757 from that era. And you can, you can see an air phone, one, one phone for every three seats. If you traveled at that time, you certainly remember this. Uh, you could pull it out, run your credit card through it, and make a call from 35,000 feet. It could be, hey, I'm in the air, or uh, the, the, the damn plane's late. I'm going to be late for the meeting. You can make that call. Very important to the FBI in the way that they untangled as much as what, of what we know uh, has happened on board this flight because that left a record. They could find a record of who made the call, or, or at least who paid for it, where it went, how long it lasted, and really important, where the people were sitting. That's how we know how far back the passengers and crew were pushed in the plane. But you can also see where there are clusters where people were sitting together and may have been kind of planning their counterattacks. So it was very valuable looking at it. It, from that perspective. And the third one, I always have to be a little careful when I say this, because there is one name and one phrase that are associated with the story of Flight 93. Todd Beamer and Let's Roll. Todd Beamer, Let's Roll. Not, not yet, Sydney. Not yet. I'll let you know. when. Todd Beamer, Let's Roll. Todd Beamer, Let's Roll. Todd Beamer, Let's Roll. That's what people think the story is of Flight 93. Folks, that's just a snippet of the story. That's not the story of Flight 93. Todd Beamer was a hero. He was absolutely a hero but he was only one of many heroes aboard this flight. And, and so part of me was trying to figure out as I'm writing this book, how did this become for so many people the story of one guy? I volunteer out, out there today, uh, and, and I was just a few weeks ago, and multiple people come and say, I wanna hear the story of Todd Beamer. So how'd this happen? There were three men aboard the plane who made calls and basically said, we're gonna try to take the plane back. But Tom Burnett and Jeremy Glick called their wives. That's the key point. Todd Beamer did place a call to his home in Cranberry, New Jersey. It fell, it dropped off in a second or two. We don't know if he thought better of it. It was just bad technology. But what he did then was hit zero and he got an at t operator in Chicago named Lisa Jefferson. And that's the conversation that goes down in American lore. Because the next day, September 12th, when, when stories started to get out that something might have happened on this plane, we didn't really know on September 11th exactly why it crashed in Somerset County. Uh, something might have happened. But reporters are, are, are calling to find out the wives of Tom Burnett and Jeremy Glick are not doing interviews. They're mourning the deaths of their husbands, the, the fathers of their children. Their lives are wrecked. But Lisa Jefferson, the operator, while traumatized, didn't know Todd Beamer before she picked up the phone. So she was able to tell that story. And what a story that was. I remember reading it. You know, on this the day after the darkest day in American history in my life, my lifetime, I've never felt like I did on September 11th. Here was this story that passengers had fought back. The young man said, let's roll. And he had two young children with a third on the way. And President Bush invited his wife to the White House. And that's how it came kind of ensconced as part of the story. And it's important for us to have this symbolism. It's important for us to have phrases like let's roll. But I think if that's all we focus on, we do a disservice to all the other people who did so much and we're heroes on, on aboard Flight 93 and who are, we are honoring uh, this week and, and for all time, really. So to the story, if you were in the Newark International Airport on Tuesday morning, September 11th, 2001, and you walked past gate 17 at about 7.30 in the morning, you would have seen 33 regular passengers and seven crew members getting ready for what they thought was a normal flight to the West Coast, United Airlines, Flight 93, Newark to San Francisco. The manifest was the same as any manifest you'd say, see today at the Pittsburgh airport. They were businessmen and grandparents and college students flying for the reasons we all travel, going to a conference, going on vacation, going home. One man was east for his grandmother's 100th birthday party. One lady was east for her grandmother's funeral. There were three college students making their final trips uh, before, before getting back to school. Again, we know one name, Todd Beamer. There's some other names you might be familiar with. Most of the people are anonymous on this flight. And next slide, Sydney. Sydney, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, these are four of the people that I, that I want to introduce you to. 
upper uh, lower right corner. Uh, and so the, just so that the poll is still up on my screen, just so you know, I don't know if the other viewers can see it, but it's, it's right in the middle of the screen. Um, lower right corner, Diora Bodley was the youngest person aboard Flight 93. Uh, Diora was 20 years old. She was from San Diego. She was about to enter her junior year at Santa Clara University up near San Francisco. Uh, she had been east visiting friends in Connecticut, New Jersey. She was actually scheduled to be on a, late, a flight later that day, but her mother told me she called that morning, was so excited she could get on an earlier flight, Flight 93, and get back to campus early. A lot of those kinds of stories on this flight. Upper left corner, Hilda Marson is the oldest person aboard Flight 93. She's 79 years old. Came, was born in Germany, came to the U.S. when she was about six, came through Ellis Island, didn't speak a word of English, became as American as you could possibly be, married a man who was a welder and a police officer, uh, raised a family with two daughters in New York and New Jersey. She worked as a teacher's aide and bookkeeper into her 70s. Um, she's also the kind of person, we, we, everybody has a person like this in her family. Look at, look at this angelic face. It's hard to think of this, but uh, uh, her family tells a story of a, a mother who once approached her at a bus stop and she hit him over the head with her umbrella and said, I know your game. So again, you look at her, you, it's hard to think of that, but we all, we all laugh at stories like that. I know there's, there's someone like that in my family. But Hilda wasn't just going on vacation. She was actually moving. She had packed three suitcases. She was going to move in with her adult daughter living in uh, San Francisco as, as life comes full circle. John Talignani, lower left, also in his 70s, U.S. Army veteran of the World War II era, owned a pizzeria in New York, bartender, told a lot of great stories. But John was traveling with a heavy heart. Just a few weeks earlier, um, his stepson had uh, been married, gone to California on his honeymoon, was killed in a car crash on his honeymoon. So John was going to the funeral and to help collect the remains and bring them back east. In upper right corner, Wanda Green obviously is a flight attendant, one of flight five flight attendants aboard Flight 93. She had been a 29-year veteran of United Airlines. Like a lot of people who've done the same thing for 29 years, she was looking for a little freshness. She was dabbling in real estate. She wanted to open her own real estate office. She was actually scheduled to fly on September 13th. She had a house closing on that day. So she asked her boss for a change in the schedule and he put her on, uh, he put her on uh, Flight 93 on September 11th. Lots of faith involved here. Now, they all boarded in a timely manner. This flight was supposed to take off at 8 o'clock. It pulled back from the gate at 8.01. If you've ever flown from the New York, New Jersey area, that's not bad. 8.01 is very close to on time. But then they just sat there. They sat there on the ground for more than 40 minutes. And that delay is absolutely crucial in the Flight 93 timeline. We would be telling a completely different story today if that flight had taken it up anywhere close to on time. Because there were four men on that plane who knew they weren't going home. They were part of a 19-man Al-Qaeda crew that was tasked to hijack four commercial airliners and crash them into buildings that symbolized American dominance, economic, military, political. Uh, next slide, Sydney. There were four flights. Uh, if you look at, the, at those takeoff times, uh, 7.45 to 8.10, it's in a tight 25-minute time span. They, this was, they planned that this would happen so fast that no one, not the FAA, not the military, not the people on board, no one could have done anything. You can see that they're all East Coast to West Coast flights, heavy fuel loads, huge explosion if you hit a building. What you can't see is that they're all 757s and 767s, identical cockpits that would help in their training. Folks, they didn't come up with this plan in August. This was years in the making. Now, the plan was that there would be on each plane a five-man hijack crew. One uh, hijacker pilot, these men had been in the country for more than a year. They were licensed to fly small planes. They went to schools and aviation schools in Florida and Arizona. Uh, and, and then they practiced on simulators of 757s, 767s, because they weren't going to have to take off or land the big planes. They just learned how to, knew how to steer them in the sky. And then there were four muscle hijackers per team, two to attack the cockpit, take out the pilot and first officer, and two to push the rest of the passengers and crew to the back of the plane and create a sterile area up there. Now here, next slide, these are the Flight 93 hijackers. Lower right corner is Ziad Jarrah, he was from Lebanon, he was the hijacker pilot. The other three men are from Saudi Arabia. The you might, not, might notice, he said the plan was for five. There are only four here. Al-Qaeda Al could not get the 20th hijacker in the country. They can only get 19 in. 
They tried very hard to get to 20th in. Nine men were nominated. One made it all the way to Orlando in August, but he was turned away by a very uh, bright and alert immigration officer who just saw some things wrong in his application. So the, they had only four hijackers in this flight. That may have led, we can only speculate, may have led to another delay in this flight, is that these guys took longer than they were supposed to to hijack the plane. We know from two of the plotters who were still down in Guantanamo that the plan was to hijack each plane within 15 minutes. That was probably unrealistic. It only happened on one flight, but the others all did it within 30. These guys took 46. So it was 928 by the time the plane was hijacked. Next slide, Tim. How do we know 928? Because one of the Air United pilots keyed the microphone to air traffic control as the attack was happening, perhaps to let people know. And what you hear, this audio tape is still available, or is very much available today. Mayday, mayday, get out of here, get out of here. There's a ma massive struggle going on in the cockpit as the hijackers come in with knives and attack the pilot first officer and, and take over the plane. The passengers and crew are pushed toward the back of the plane. They start making their phone calls at 9.30, just two minutes later, 9.30. 37 calls made from, that, from, uh, from the plane, 35 on the air phones. Now, it wasn't great technology. 20 of those calls dropped off after a few seconds. No, no conversation possible. But 15 got through. And that is how we know as much as we know is what happened on this flight. Because think of it, the, the passengers and crew on Flight 93, they're just calling their loved ones to tell them they're terrified. Their plane is being hijacked. The unintended consequence is they're getting information from their loved ones on the ground. Remember, because of the delay, this flight's not hijacked till about 930. The first plane hits the first tower at 846. We thought that was an accident. The second plane hits the second tower at 903. Then we know we're under attack. The massive national media coverage starts. So the loved ones have been watching television for a half hour, and they're telling the people on the plane, two planes have hit the World Trade Center. Imagine what would have what that image would have looked like on your head. I mean, we have the video. We, we know we all know what that what that explosion looked like. I don't know how you would have processed that if you were on the plane, but that's how they first got that that information. Now, for the first ten minutes or so, when all the loved ones recounting the, the calls that was discussed, there's not any talk about taking back the plane. They're just bewildered, sharing information. It's not really until the third plane hits the Pentagon that they're galvanized and they know they have to do something. That's at 9.37. If you think of this, their counterattack was started at 9.57. They had maximum of 20 minutes to come up with this plan. I, I stand in awe of that still today, how they were to process that, in, process that information and, uh, and, and, and come up with their plan to, to, to attack. Next slide, Sydney. Again, they're in the back of the plane with this narrow aisle. That would have been their perspective, looking, looking down that aisle. You know, we don't, we don't know exactly uh, what their plan was. We don't even know exactly who took part. Uh, we've tried to piece it together as best we can. A lot of this is going to be a mystery forever. Um, but there are six people I'm pretty sure were involved. Cindy, could you go ahead and two slides to the, to the pictures of the individuals? I'm pretty sure these six were involved. Upper left, Jeremy Glick. He's 6'1", 215 pounds. He's a black belt in judo. He's a former national collegiate judo champion at the University of Rochester. Certainly a guy you'd want on your side if you were going to be in a fight. Upper center is Tom Burnett, 6'2", 205, former high school quarterback, nominated to the Air Force Academy. He didn't go because he wanted to get into business. He was now COO of a medical services company, about to become CEO leadership every step of the way. I think he was the leader. Upper right, Mark Bingham, 6'4", 225. Getting a little trend here. These are big, strong guys. Bingham, two-time national rugby champion at Cal Berkeley. Teammates said he was like a missile going down the field. Uh, he jumped off cliffs. He ran with the Bulls in Spain. He was a daredevil. Todd Beamer, lower left corner, six feet, 200, small college, two-sport star at Wheaton College in Illinois, baseball and basketball. Those four made calls. We're pretty sure of their stories. Uh, I have no doubt that they all were part of this is a heroic and massive counterattack. Joey Naki, lower center. Joey didn't make a call. He said 13 people made calls. That meant 27 didn't. We don't know their stories. We don't know the full story of D-Day because a lot of those stories died on the beach. 
We don't know the full story of Pickett's charge because a lot of those people died at Gettysburg. Same thing here. Joey's family told me he never would have called us. He wouldn't have worried us. Folks, I, just to pause here, that would have been my reaction. I can tell you, I, I hope none of us were ever in this situation, obviously, but I can tell you from the family members I talked to, the ones who got calls are more at peace with this. At least they heard from their loved ones. The ones who didn't call, that calls, they're always that question. But Joey's family said he never would have called. So how, why do I think he was involved? Sometimes you have to look at personalities. He was 5'9", 200 pounds, barrel-chested weightlifter, loud, gruff, told his wife, no one will ever take me down without a fight. Just doesn't seem to me to be the type of guy who would say, you guys go ahead and attack the cockpit. I'm going to sit here. You let me know how that goes. So I think he and, of course, many others, uh, I think, were also involved. There were lots of roles that these people played. And Don Green, uh, lower right, we'll get to him in just a second. The counterattack begins at 957. How do we know that? There were two ladies who were on the phone. They both cut off their calls at 957. One passenger to her mother in New Jersey, one flight attendant to her husband in Florida. One said, I've got to go. Everybody's running the first class. The other said, I've got to go. Everyone's running to the cockpit. We also know from the cockpit voice recorder, this was the only plane where both black boxes were recovered because it didn't hit a building. In the cockpit voice recorder, just as the clock's about to turn 9.58, uh, Zia Jara, the hijacker pilot in the cockpit, says, what's that, a fight? You can, they could hear in the back the fight, probably Jeremy Glick leading the way, the judo, black, black belt of judo, uh, taking on the muscle hijackers uh, in the back. Down they go through that, that narrow highway. They're making some progress. But then Jara, we can tell this from the flight data recorder, the National Transportation Safety Board was able to get the flight data recorder and do an animation of the entire flight path. And it's online. It's available to the public. Jara starts to rock the wings, 30 degrees each way almost a violent turn. Have you ever been on a plane and tried to get up during a, a little rainstorm? You know how, how hard it is to keep your footing? Imagine 30 degrees each way for a pilot who doesn't, doesn't know what he's doing. The, tra the transcript of the voice recorder talks about loud noises. Luggage must have been falling up, the, up the, those compartments. Dishes are crashing. But Girard couldn't keep that going because he had to get to his targets. We leveled the plane out and they started their push again. At about just after 10 o'clock, and again, for perspective, folks, the counterattack begins at 9.57. The plane crashes at 10.03. So it's a six-minute battle in the air. Just after 10 o'clock, there is a native English-speaking voice, one of the passengers, on the, on the uh, cockpit voice recorder that says, in the cockpit, if we don't, we'll die. Think of that. In the cockpit, if we don't, we'll die. We stop here to say, you know, we as Americans have a way of taking great historic factual stories and having a need to build myth and legend on top of them, makes them even greater than they were. Very American thing to do. We've been doing it since 1776. How many times have you heard the passengers and crew of Flight 93 crash that plane to save lives? They brought down that plane to save those people in the Capitol. Well, that's what happened. But listen to their own testimony. In the cockpit, if we don't, we'll die. To me, that means... They had in their minds an alternative to dying. Donald Green, lower right corner, was licensed to fly small planes. He worked for a company that sold airplane parts. He was, he was a veteran of aviation. Another man on board, Sonny Garcia, early in his life, had done eight years of air traffic control for the California Air National Guard. They knew aviation. Was it a long shot? Sure. But there was perhaps a fighting chance. Five of us could try to take back the cockpit, but we can't fly, fly the plane. Uh, what difference would it make? So in the cockpit, if we don't, we'll die. I think they were trying to get Donald Green in there to try to get him. Perhaps, it was a long shot, but perhaps every step of the way, if they had, you know, it was a clear day. If they had instruction from air traffic control every step of the way, maybe this guy knew enough that he could have gotten the plane on the ground. Unfortunately, the plane was too low. It was too late when they started their attack. Now, did they get to the cockpit? The FBI was never to confirm, able to confirm that they did because all the evidence was basically shattered. I believe they did, and maybe because I want to believe that they did. But in the, on the transcript of the recorder, and only the families have heard the actual tape, but the FBI put out a very detailed uh, transcript. All of a sudden, at the end, as they're, as, as they're getting to the cockpit, the, the, the sounds are very loud. The voices are loud. And the microphones are in the cockpit. Also, there's an exchange. There's an interesting exchange if you look at the, at the transcript. 
An English voice says, turn it up. An Arabic voice says, pull it down. Turn it up, pull it down. Turn it up, pull it down. To me, that sounds like there might have been a struggle for control. In the final minute, the, uh, the animation of the flight path from the uh, flight data recorder shows us that the steering wheel or yoke, or yoke turns very hard to the right, and the plane turns upside down in midair. Now, we don't know exactly why that happened. There are two theories. Either the passenger and crew were in the cockpit and they were struggling for control in the midst of that, the wheel turned, or we know that the hijackers were told if they could not reach their cockpit to crash the plane. Muhammad Atta, who was the overall leader, flew the first plane into the World Trade Center, told his fellow hijackers that if he could not reach the World Trade Center, he would crash his plane into the streets of New York City, which still caused devastation. So Gerard may at that point at the last minute just under duress have crashed the plane. Regardless, whatever happened, it was because of the pressure of the pastors and crew that, that, that caused that to happen. So at 10.03 and nine seconds, we hear the last English voice on the recorder. Uh, one of the passengers yells simply, no. And at 10.03 and 11 seconds, Flight 93 crashes at 563 miles an hour, upside down at a 40 degree angle into an open field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania on a reclaimed strip mine. The result was absolute devastation. The theory is from the evidence, the front third sheared off shattered and flew into a grove of hemlock trees right behind the crash site. They had to bring, the FBI had to bring tree surges and arborists down from Penn State to climb those trees. There was so much evidence up there. The bottom two thirds of the plane, what if the FBI agent said it basically accordioned on itself into the ground, deep into the ground. They found items from the plane 35 feet into the ground. They dug 40 just to make sure. The black boxes are on the back of the plane. They found them 15 feet and 25 feet deep. Uh, Sydney, next uh, slide. These are some of the early images of left. Uh, the upper left photo is the only photo taken in the immediate aftermath of this crash. It is so difficult for us folks to explain to young people. We do tours. Hopefully we'll get back to them again and we, we get beyond COVID. But we would do tours of middle school students. They couldn't understand that in 2001, we didn't have cameras in our cell phones. Imagine how, and we obviously we had no connectivity. There was no social media. Imagine how this story would have been reported different, differently, both good and bad, if we had all that back then. This was a lady, photo was taken from a lady who lived about a mile and a half away. The one thing that struck me when I talked to and, and heard about what the, the local residents said is not that they, so much that they saw it or heard it, but that they felt it. Imagine a 757 hitting at 563 miles an hour. She said her house shook. And there was a camera right there in her kitchen and she ran to the window and took that photo. There wasn't much of a fire here. There was a huge fireball, obviously because the jet fuel when it hit the ground, but there was no building to burn. So that fireball was there. So that's, that's really an iconic image of the crash. And obviously lower right corner is the early, one of the early images of the crater. And there you see the hemlock trees where they found a lot of, of the evidence. Next uh, slide, Sydney. About the biggest piece of the plane they found was upper left piece of the fuselage about the size of a hood of a car. Lower right is the flight data recorder. That's one of the black boxes. And one thing I learned in this is black boxes aren't black, they're orange. So you can find them in, in water or perhaps in a crater. They were to find uh, both of those. The FBI was there for about 14 days. Again, they, they thought this was the site they would gain the most evidence and untangle the plot that was true. Because again, this plane, didn't hit a building. Imagine how much evidence was lost when the Twin Towers crumbled and when that wall at the Pentagon crumbled. That didn't happen here. So they were able to find a lot of evidence. But after 14 days, uh, they left and they turned it over to the Somerset County Coroner. And from that point on, it became a very small town America story, a small town Pennsylvania story. But people, some of my friends were surprised. There are seven chapters in the book after the plane crashes. There is so much depth to this story. So much happened after the plane crash, not just the FBI and the investigation and the families coming together, but what the people of Somerset County did here. You know, the family members know that they had a different experience than the people in New York and DC. Why? I mean, this wasn't New York and DC. This was little Shanksville. This was little Somerset. Those folks, folks opened their hearts and homes. They're still really close friends to today. One uh, lady whose daughter was on the plane told me, if it had to happen anywhere, I'm glad it happened here. And one example of that, and he's kind of another one of the heroes of, of the book is, is the coroner, Wally Miller. 
he was a sort of the corner of Somerset County. He wasn't a PhD. He wasn't a doctor. He didn't have great medical credentials. He was a local funeral home director, but he, he did, would do maybe a hundred funeral homes at home, uh, funerals a year in Somerset. But he treated all these folks like a small town funeral director. They were surprised. They would, some of them were in California. And they'd say, we'd call Wally at midnight. He'd answer his phone. So again, there, there was, there's that small town feel to it. Those local folks got together and they started the early temporary memorials. Again, New York and DC have tourist infrastructure. They have tourism bureaus, they have hotels, transportation. There's no tourism director in Shanksville. A couple of ladies at a, a church one day said, we can't have people coming to our, our town and, and, and nobody to, to greet them. So there wasn't much of a, more, a memorial, but Sydney, next slide. If you were out there during this time, they cleared a little area and they put up a fence and people would leave those mementos. Sometimes they would come back uh, in, in tribute to the 40 heroes. And sometimes people would come back, you know, months or, or years later and say, where's my item? They cleaned off that fence every Sunday. It was, it was filled every, they would clean it off and they took the items to the Somerset County Historical Society and they put the clean fence up and it was filled again. The next 60,000 items. They recorded at the uh, Somerset County Historical Society. Some of those items are on display today at the Flight 93 National Memorial. On the 10th anniversary, they were able to fund and open the, the, the lower part of the memorial. Uh, Sydney, next slide. If you've been out there, this is a very beautiful wall of names, that white marble wall, which marks the flight path. Uh, and there's the name of each member of the passengers and crew. And out there on that mode uh, lane, You'll see right before the trees, a big sandstone boulder. That's the site of the, of the, of the plane crash. So you can see kind of a, a black walkway here. I think this is very appropriate. As of now, the general public can only get to within about 75 yards of that crash site. Only the family members are allowed to go all the way out. Again, yeah, maybe in 50 years or so, this will be like Gettysburg. We'll be able to go out there. But right now, it's so close. It's still so intense for those family members, this first generation. That's their grave site. So only they can go out there. You might see a little, there are always a couple of items out there that family members leave. Um, I was there on the 10th anniversary, just drove out as a, as a citizen when they dedicated this memorial. I'll never forget this little town just outside Shanksville, Pennsylvania, population 245. You look up on stage. There are two former presidents of the United States, President Clinton and President George W. Bush. And I don't care what your politics are. When you're in a little town like that and you look up on a stage, you see two former presidents, you know something, something really powerful happened here. It was, it was a great program. And since then, uh, four years later, they were able to open the visitor center. So now that Maury was complete, it's a, it's a very beautiful, beautiful place. And I often would try to figure out how to end my talk once. And how do I, how do I wrap up? what memorials mean, why we have memorials, and why people even go to them. Because I can tell you when people come here, they're, they're different when they leave. They're happy-go-lucky, they show up, they're talking, they're chatting. They're different when they leave. It's, it's much more somber. You feel like something happened here. And I, finally, I went back to, my, my other love is Gettysburg, and uh, there was a great speech given in the 1880s by a man named Joshua Chamberlain, who was the Colonel of the 20th Maine Regiment during the Battle of Gettysburg, did some very heroic things. He was back about 20 years later to dedicate his regimental monument. A very learned man, four-time governor of Maine, uh, and he spoke about why people would come back to visit that memorial, why it was important to the men. But I think it, it speaks to why people visit all memorials. Uh, what Chamberlain said is, in great deeds, something abides. On great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass, bodies disappear, but spirits linger to consecrate ground for the vision place of souls. And reverent men and women from afar, generations who know us not and we know not of, heart drawn to see where and by whom great things are suffered and done for them, shall come to this deathless field to ponder and dream. That was very appropriate at Gettysburg in the 1880s. It's just as pro appropriate at Somerset County in 2021. If you haven't been out there, I hope you come out and join us someday at the uh, uh, Flight 93 National Memorial and pay tribute to these heroes. Thank you very much. And there's there's a little there's an image of uh, of the interior of the of the visitor center, which has added so much to uh, the educational piece, not just for children, but for adults as well. I think they they just did a very good job putting this memorial together. So thank you very much. I'll be willing to uh, engage any of your questions if you have. Um, anyone is more than welcome to type any questions they had into the chat and also turning on video. 
can now unmute yourself and you can start asking the question that way. One question I have for you, Tom. I already have the answer from having read it and seen some of your other talks, but uh, I, don't, I can't remember if you said it this evening, but what was the actual intended target of flight night? Yes, we're 99.9% .9 sure it was the capital. Certainly it was Washington, D.C. because they had, they had put that into the, the navigational service. Gerard put that into the navigational instruments when he turned the plane around over Cleveland. Um, the two plotters down in Guantanamo both said that target was Capitol Hill. We also know that that from some of the investigations the 9-11 Commission did, bin Laden, Osama bin Laden wanted the White House to be a target. But Mohammed Atta and some of the other hijackers who were already in the U.S., pushed back and told him that the White House would have been too hard to distinguish from the sky. And think of that. It's not that distinctive of a building from up high. There are lots of white buildings in D.C. The Capitol is very distinct. The World Trade Center is very distinct. The Pentagon is very distinct. So a lot of things here add up. Uh, it also was a day of, it wasn't quite a joint session of Congress, but both houses, both the House and the Senate were in session that day. Imagine if the plane had hit while all those 535 legislators were in, were in the building. So there's the overwhelming evidence points to the Capitol. We'll never know for certain, but I certainly believe it's the Capitol. And we have another question. How are the folks in Shanksville 20 years later? You know, they react probably the way all, all of us would have. Some of them, some of them are, are out there all the time. They're, they're part of the group of ambassadors that volunteer and greet you if you're out there greet you every day the park service obviously would, is not funded very well anymore it doesn't have a lot of employees they do a great job with what they have but they really need the volunteers and so they're out there and and some go on an occasion and some have just moved on you know uh some i think everybody handles this differently in a way i'll just divert the question to are the family members still involved and i always tell people it's about a third a third a third a third of them are pretty much living their lives to honor their loved ones. And they are the foundation of this memorial. They're, they're there all the time. They're, they're so dedicated. About a third of them come back on occasion. Some of that is just because of distance. I mean, this plane wasn't supposed to crash anywhere near here. Uh, a lot of people from California. There were five people who weren't from the U.S. on the flight. So some of it's just distance. And about a third of the people have moved on. Uh, they've remarried and, and, and moved on. I'm sure they memorialize it quietly, but but they don't come back very much. I think what you learn is everybody handles tragedy so differently. Uh, and, and that's okay. However you choose to do that is fine. Uh, you know, one of the, the Gordy, Gordy Feld, whose brother was on the plane, was one of those who was fine. He was one of the spokesmen, one of the family spokesmen to the media, in the media aftermath, because a lot of them didn't want to talk to the media. They just weren't ready to do it. Gordy said he, he did it to honor his brother, but the difficult thing was he had so much grief, and, and he and they had to share their grief with the world. He said, it's, it's, it was tough enough emotionally to lose my brother in any situation, but we had to share our grief with the world. That made it a little more difficult. But, but some of them step forward and, uh, and, and they continue to help tell the story. Thank you. Um, I switched the slide. We had a, a chat come in requesting it to be up on this slide. And now we have yes. another question. Tourists can visit the site, but you indicated they are not currently doing tours. Do you know when tours may begin? Well, the, it's open. The, the, the more it's, it's open. I meant we're not doing, we weren't doing official bus tours of students. Okay. Uh, there, no, the memorial has remained open. And it's outdoors. And, and uh, the last time I was there, you had to wear a mask in the visitor center, or mm -hmm. they were asking you to wear a mask in the visitor. But the memorial is outdoor. It's, uh, and it's all self guided? Yes. Well, there's, okay. there, because they're, they're, it is. The, the visitor center is very instructive. If anybody goes there, the first thing I say, go to the visitor center and go through that story. And it, 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 it lays out the story of what, of what you're going to see. And then there are volunteers and several rangers at each, at each of the key spots. So we encourage you, I would encourage people to ask questions because as volunteers, and it's a solemn site, we're told not to be proactive, we're told to be reactive. So if you come up as a visitor, I don't go to you and say, hey, this is the story. I wait for you to ask a question. And a lot of people do, but some don't. I, I wish more would ask. So there are people There are people every step of the way who, who can help tell you the story, help uh, fulfill the story. Another thanks, Tom. Excellent presentation. You made the point that information becomes available long after the event occurs. Has any new information come to light after you wrote the book? Not of any significance that I'm aware of. Um, 
And I think, you know, a lot of this information, if anything else comes forward, and I don't think it'll be much, if the two plotters in Guantanamo ever go to trial, they have not gone to trial yet, there would be evidence in that case. I, I, I can't imagine that over 20 years, there's much in there that hasn't become public or it wouldn't have leaked out. The, the one frustrating thing as an investigator, as a historian, is, is that this is all we're going to know. Like a, a student of the Civil War, even today, one of you could go up in your attic or down in your basement in an old box and find a letter from your third great grandfather who was in the Civil War, and it might solve a mystery. Those things, you know, so many, so many of those folks lived after the war, and then some of their items still exist. That's never going to happen here. Everybody who knows what happened on the plane passed away on that plane. So as far you know with the book you're you're i'm humbled to, to do it but you, you try to piece together the story as best we can we're never going to know everything and especially with, like i said 13 people made calls 27 different what perspectives could they have added we'll never know that but as far as any hard uh actual evidence hard evidence that would that would change what do we look to think no and uh and, you know, there are going to be a lot of documentaries out of it in, in the next week. If there's anything, I'm sure, want to come out. But it, if somebody would have, a uh, PR person would have uh, leaked that out already. So I, I think the basic part of the story, what, what we have is what we're going to know. Thank you. Uh, well, compliment. Compliment saying thank you for the info. Great book. Um, another question. Looking at the flight path, do you think Flight 93 flew over Pittsburgh? It was very close. It wasn't directly over Pittsburgh, but it was very close to West Pennsylvania and to, to our area. Uh, I think of two things. I was working for the Penguins at the time. Our offices were across the street from the old arena. So I was in the Marriott building. And I remember looking out after the plane. There were so many people in downtown Pittsburgh parked up, at, you know, up in those arena lots. After the third plane hit the Pentagon, it was like the city had a fire drill. There were thousands of people going home. Because um, you, at that point, we we're all scared. We didn't know. And I thought at about that time, Flight 93 wasn't that far away from Pittsburgh. And that's one thing, just the quirk of fate and the blessing that this went down into an open field. Because, you know, if the attack had started earlier under different circumstances, it could have come down in Pittsburgh. It could have come down in Somerset, population 6,000. Um, you know, it was it was in line with the, with the, with the Shanksville school, but it was in the in the air for another second or two, it might have hit the Shanksville school. But just by quirk of fate or blessing of God or whatever, it, you know, it, it landed in that open field. And no other, unlike the other two crashes, no one else was killed other than those folks on the plane. So very close. Another comment from someone that said their sister in law also went down to uh, Somerset to help. She said a lot of people from Indiana County went to offer food and help. Yes, yes. It, 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 this was a citizen effort here. And part of it, I think, you know, so much of the media resources and so much of the, of the federal resources went to those other two sites. It's New York and Washington, D.C. Those, those were the big international stories. This, in some ways, was and remains the forgotten site. Uh, and it was, it was Pennsylvanians. It was not Somerset Townians, but also the, you know, the, the people in Johnstown, the people in Indiana, the people in Pittsburgh who went out to volunteer and help out, you know, the Wally Miller of the Corner had had fire companies over the weekend just walking the site to make sure there wasn't. He didn't want to open the site to the families until he was sure he'd gotten all the debris. So they he was painstakingly, you know, as a, as a funeral director would, the, the volunteer fire companies from all over the area would go out there and they'd walk the field uh, to make sure that they were able to collect everything. So that in Western Pennsylvania, I mean, it's a tragedy that this happened. But I think folks in our area can be proud of the way we responded. And everybody who did that has contributed to this memorial. So should, I would hope they would go there today and take pride uh, in the way they chipped in in, in, in many different ways to, to build this memorial to honor the heroes. This is excellent. Thank you, Tom. I want to mention that you did an excellent hour at the site for Battlefield, Pennsylvania. That's also excellent. <laughs> Thank great, you. Great presentation. Thank you, Tom. A question. Do you know when the Tower of Voices will be fixed? I don't have the latest update. I mean, they're, they've they've obviously been working a lot on the technology there. That is, for those who don't know, that is the symbolic piece at the entrance to the memorial, several miles from the actual crash site. The idea of the, the, the there was a design competition for this memorial. There were over a thousand entries. The man whose firm won it, Paul Murdoch, 
his idea was for a landscape memorial. He didn't want to build a lot of them. Some of these people go out and say, where are all the monuments? There's not a lot there because he wanted it to look like Somerset County. It would something that wouldn't be appropriate to New York City or Washington, D.C. And I think he he achieved that. The visitor center is the educational piece. At the entranceway, he envisioned a 93 feet uh, tower of voices with 40 wind chimes for the 93 and 40, the 40 people on board. So almost replicating their voices. Uh, technology <laughs> can be a challenge. So they're continuing to work on that. It's up. Uh, they, they can they can. Uh, get the chimes working on occasion. You can hear some of the chimes, but that's something that they're they're going to continue to work on. It's just a, a technological challenge with that with that weather out there. But folks are working hard at it, and you know the families of Flight 93 really excited that 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 tower got up a few years ago, um, and which physically completed the memorial. And that that's the thing that, that's what greets you. And it still gets a, you know it, it gets a lot of visitors. The first thing you a lot of things the first thing a lot of people see they go to is, is that tower of voices. Yeah, great presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you. I must say, I am showing my age because I got a little upset when I saw the pictures of the terrorists. Remember when people wouldn't show them out of deference to those who died? So I understand why you showed them. Yeah, I, I think, and I hear, to, and to the extent I often say this, the extent the book has gotten criticism, it's that there's too much on the hijackers. The, the challenge is if you're a historian, uh, you, you have to write the complete story. We cannot write about Pearl Harbor without our writing about the Japanese Navy and Air Force. We can't write about uh, Washington crossing the Delaware without writing about the British. The, the enemy is part of this story. And, and, but the other thing that I think it's really important, because I often get that, I, want, I only want to read about the heroes. I want to see what the heroes are. Folks, you can't appreciate what those 40 people did and let, when they had less than 20 minutes to figure it out, unless you understand how long and hard and detailed those hijackers plan. This, this uh, assault was first proposed to Osama bin Laden in 1996, five years out. Now, he didn't accept it, but it was in the works. He accepted it early January of 1999. So it's two and a half years of hard planning. And the hijacker pilots all came in the spring of 2000. So they're here for more than a year. And the muscle hijackers then came in the next year. So I understand the point. People don't want to see them. I understand. But it really, I, I don't think, you. as I said before, I don't think you can truly appreciate what these people did, the magnificence of what they did, those 40 heroes, unless you realize they had 20 minutes to untangle a plot that was years in the making. And I, you know, every time I go out there, every time I think about this, every time I open my own book, I stand in awe of them for doing that. So I think the hijacker part of the story is a, is a counterpoint to what they did. It, 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 in a way, showing how hard uh, Al-Qaeda planned for this enhances the greatness of the 40 heroes. That's just my opinion. Yeah, another comment, and I just looked it up. The mastermind trial started today. What are the chances they would talk? So it looks like they finally resumed the pre-trial hearings. Yeah, pre-trial pre, pre, pre hearings. It's been a long time coming, and there have been a lot of false starts. And I, you know, I don't know if uh, if they'll ever get to try. And people often ask me about that. Obviously, I'm interested in it. But th with this book, I looked at one flight. Once I looked at the story of Flight 93. Now you pick up other information, but it's not something that I have continued to investigate as time moves on. I I, I follow it like any other interested observer. I know the family members are very, the family members I know are very interested. They're, they're hoping that this trial happens. There have just been so many delays. So I, I, I hope it happens someday. A few more comments. Excellent presentation, Tom. I really enjoyed hearing all the stories about the passengers. I've learned a lot of new details today. Thank you, very interesting. And one more question. Are trees still being planted at Flight 93? My family had an opportunity years ago to plant them. Off. Yes. Yes, part of part of Paul Murdoch's Paul Murdoch's vision was that there would be a belt of trees that would grow in the outer part of the of the uh, of the memorial to to, uh, to to kind of hem it in a little bit, um, and that is happening. But it take, that takes a lot of time; it takes twenty years and months. So I've been there's a there's a volunteer program every spring. Uh, plant a tree for Flight 93. I've been involved in some of those where people just go out, we plant trees. Obviously, there are experts who help us do this. And, and a lot of those trees uh, take hold. Some of them don't. Um, obviously, a lot of the volunteer group events 
with what we've experienced in the world in the last in the last 18 months have been scaled back or not done. But I know those those will those will continue. And the people like your family and, and people like me, the people who do that, I take pride every time I drive down that road and I see those trees. Alive. I wonder which tree I planted. I, I hope at least one of my trees is, is, is growing. But a lot of people have pitched into this memorial. And I think that's, you know, that's part of the aura of it. We do get, you know, we, we do get on Sundays in the summer, a lot of people driving back from vacation from the beach, going to Michigan or Wisconsin or wherever, and they see the turnpike sign, the sign of the, and they'll stop. And they'll say, they're just in a decent, they'll say, this reminds me of the feeling I got at the Vietnam Memorial. And I would agree, you, you, you're kind of affected by it the same way. But what the, the difference I point out is that the Vietnam Memorial that you visit is in the mall in Washington, D.C. This memorial is right where the plane crashed. I mean, you're looking right where it happened. And that it gives you, uh, it, it almost can be eerie at times. As, as you, I try to think back on what it must have looked like, what it must have sounded like on that day. Uh, as, as again, as part of the, uh, as a tribute to what the to what those folks did. I, I just can't imagine how they came to that decision and how terrified they must, as brave as they were, how terrified they must have been. Um, but they succeeded in their mission, even though they didn't they didn't save the plane the way they wanted to. They, in many ways, they succeeded in their mission, and we will honor them forever. Question, did some of the hijackers practice? For example, did they actually take practice flights to see what the pitfalls yes. would be? Yes, we know that from their from their records. Uh, they took, they cased flights. Uh, the, the pilot, the hijacker pilots did this multiple times. And they would take the same, not the, the exact same route, but they would go, you know, east coast to west coast. And they would observe uh, the happenings aboard, what the flight attendants did. When, when the pilot would leave would leave the cockpit, for instance. So they check things out. So it, at least, not all, not all the muscle hijackers did, but at least all the pilots did. So they had a pretty good sense of, uh, of the rhythm of the work of those people on planes. They did a lot of, you know, it, it's, it's maddening when you look at it. They took advantage of our freedoms and did a lot of study. Uh, and, 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 and again, it adds to how I look at how magnificent those 40 heroes were in untangling this plot because these guys had, had plotted and planned so well. But yes, they were the, the hijacker pilots and even the muscle hijackers. I mean, they lived in this country under their own names. They did not try to conceal their identities. They got bank accounts, driver's licenses, joined gyms. Um, it's almost as though they wanted to leave a record that they were here. Another question, was September 11th picked for a specific reason? Was religion? Any importance with the date? Not that, not that we know of, um, because Bin Laden was pushing for this to happen much, much earlier. He was at, he was afraid. We know this from the 9/11 Commission investigation uh, that that this would there were so many uh, operatives in the United States that it might be found out there might be a slip up. So he was pushing them, and, and uh, Mohammed Atta, who was the operational planner again, the high, who flew the first plane to the World Trade Center, thought he needed more time. Now, you know, I think they did pick a Tuesday on purpose because, again, they checked their life. Think of uh, they wanted a light travel time. What would be a lighter travel time than a Tuesday morning? So neither, none of these flights had a lot of people on. There, again, there were only 33 regular. If you count the hijackers, there were 37 passengers on flight next. That's all. The other planes had somewhat bigger loads, but, but not much. So Tuesday was picked for sure. There's some speculation that they might have known that both houses of Congress were meeting that day, but that would have been just to just on the flight 93 flight. So there's nothing that we can find that there was any reason in advance to pick to pick 9/11. I think it, Otto was going to go when he was ready. I think a, a Tuesday was on purpose. So were the pilots killed with knives, or did not box? Any transmission between the pilot and air control prior to the cockpit getting faded? Some of the some of those questions just can't be answered. We just we we, we won't know. We 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 can't know. Um, there is there's audio of the sounds, but we don't know what happened. The reason I was talked about box cutters and knives. It was reported very early on that that a hijacker used box cutter like September twelfth, and that all of a sudden became the story that that was the hijacker's weapons. And as you look into this, and that in the public's mind, that, that's what I meant. Uh, and then you find out that that they they bought lots of knives. You know, they again they bought these Leatherman wave tools. You can still buy it. Google them. You can see them. They have multiple blades. 
So they had, they had multiple weapons on board. Which ones they used, I don't know. I, I just think it's, it's most plausible that they used the knives. Because some of these we're never going to know. It's always a little dangerous as a historian to speculate, but that's all we can do here. And I think you have to say, is it plausible that this could have happened? So I just think it makes more sense because we know they had these weapons that they would have used the knives as a box. Can I tell you that that absolutely happened? No. And, and once, you know, on the flight, all we have uh, of what we know are, are what the loved ones told us about the phone calls. Those calls were not recorded. There were three voicemail messages, but the calls themselves were not recorded. So it's just a testimony of the loved ones telling us. And then from the time the attack started at 9.57, we simply don't know. There's the cockpit voice recorder, um, but but that's it. We, we can't really possibly know who was involved, exactly what they did. It's, as a historian, it's frustrating. But it's not like there's another piece of evidence, <clears throat> excuse me, that can come forward. We're just not going to know. That. So it's, it's all speculation. Another question came in. Are there any thoughts regarding the Shanksville flight being shot down by government planes, considering the engines were found at five miles away? I was wondering when that question was going to come. Sometimes I ask my, I, I, before questions started, I ask myself that question. Because that always comes up. The flight was not shot down. Um, there is so much evidence. I go into it in the book. There's just so much evidence. It would take me 20 minutes to put all the evidence that it wasn't shut down. Um, what I tell the people who, who insist that it was, or they know somebody who knows it was, conspiracy theories are seductive. I was a JFK, JFK assassination conspiracy theorist. I probably still am. Uh, I know that it's interesting to do this. But folks, there has to be some evidence. It can't just be might. It might anything could have. There is absolutely no evidence that that happened. And there's lots of evidence that that this story, what the Bastards and Crew did, uh, it, it is, is what happened. Uh, among other things, um, we did not to get too many details. There were not a lot of F-16s that were uh, weaponized at that point. We didn't need them. We weren't going to be under attack. There were four planes in the northeastern United States that had weapons on them. Did, were they uh, scrambled? Sure. Two went. Two from Otis Air Force Base went over New York City after the second plane hit. After the Pentagon flight was hit, two were scrambled from Langley. They went the wrong way. They went over the ocean. Why? Because that was their training. They were trained against international attacks. Now they were back over Washington, D.C. by 10 o'clock, but but uh, the passengers and crew took you know took care of that. You know the the military said that if this plane had gotten all the way to Washington D.C. it was unresponsive, that they would have shot it down. That's speculation. We don't know. There's no order to. So there's just no evidence, and and uh, I I wouldn't uh, waste any time thinking about it. It is interesting though, uh, as one of those folly conspiracies, when you're involved in writing a book, to read conspiracy sites that talk about you. I mean me. To read about myself on conspiracy sites and these conspiracy people talking about what my motivations for writing the book must have been and that you watch Macmillan is going to get a big raise and a big job. Still waiting. Uh, another question. How far away was debris recovered from the crash? Um, well, there was it was a mail flight. So there was a lot of there, the mail, the letters blew long ways. Um, uh, most of the evidence was found we use a downstream, downhill, because right behind those trees, there's a hill. And so remember, the plane is coming 563 miles an hour, hits the ground. So they, they found evidence in those trees. They found parts of one of the engines in a, in a, in a pond down the hill there, uh, you know, a couple hundred yards away. Uh, the one thing about, you know, the shoot down theory is that, as the coroner told me and a couple of FBI agents, you know, if, if somebody had shot at once, somebody would have seen it. There'd be a record of it and the, and the pilot would have claimed credit for it. But there would have been pieces of the plane before the crash site. There's nothing. All the evidence is after the crash site. So, um, you know, it's it scattered over a wide area. The mail flew, every, you know, for, I, I, I can't, not being a scientist, I can't imagine the impact of a vehicle that large and that heavy hitting at an angle at 563 miles an hour. I don't know that those of us normal human beings who aren't trained to do that can even get our arms around it as, as to what that would have been like. Again, going back to the local residents saying not so much they saw or heard, but they felt it, what that would have felt like. 
And there were a number of people also who saw the plane in its final moments. They, you know, near in summer said they saw the, the wings wave and they saw it upside down and they saw it low. Um, so there were witnesses to it. As far as I know, there's only one or two people that are working in a scrapyard who actually saw it hit the ground. But there were a number of people who saw it because it, it, it was so low for the last part of its, of its flight path. So you can kind of track it that way. One last question. Is it known what school in the US the terrorists trained uh, at flying? For the airlines? Um, yes. It, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know, we, we know which ones they are. They, they trained it, it, the two in, uh, in uh, Venice, Florida, just south of Sarasota. Uh, that's where three of them, and the other one uh, trained at uh, Huffman in Arizona. So I, de I identified them all in, in my book, and the the 911 Commission got their uh, got their flight records, got their flight training records, their applications, and their grades every day, and their score, their test scores. So we know everything they did about about how they uh, how they trained, how often they trained, what they scored, and also then moving on to practicing on the simulators of the 757, 760. So all of, all of those things, there are lots of records um, about the hijackers' activities up until 9-11, where they stayed, how they got to the cities, you know, the, the flights they took, where they stayed in Newark and where they stayed in Boston. It's, I can tell you, researching that, it, it's a little eerie. It's a little emotional to, to see it. But we, we know exactly what they, when they got to the U.S. and what they did. And, you know, they have credit card receipts. Uh, for their lives, so we can we can we can follow all that. So yes, and, and you know I know uh, one of the I one of the flight school instructors did an oral history for Flight 93. I quote him on my book. You know, imagine how those people felt. They were just teaching students. They ended up, you know, when you, say, you know, I, I taught one of these guys how to fly. I, I did, you know, he couldn't. It's not his fault. He was he teaches thousands of students to fly. But imagine how you would carry that burden. He didn't do anything wrong, but it, he feels like he, he carries a burden because he, in, in, a, in some way he was part of this. And very last question for tonight. Uh, what is happening for the 20th anniversary at Flight 93? It is going to be, uh, I think, the largest collection of family members that they will ever have, certainly the largest since the first year. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, they're not able to open the ceremony to the general public. So it's just open to the family members and invited guests that morning. So the, the memorial will, will, is open all week, is open all day, Friday the 10th. I'll be volunteering out there. It will be closed in the morning on Friday the 11th when there will be a ceremony. And then, and then the memorial will open again at noon and, and be open the rest of the day and the rest of the year. So it's just that time frame. Uh, and uh, former President Bush is the keynote speaker. There will be other speakers. You can imagine the traffic out there uh, when a president shows up on Route 30. There's only one way in. So, uh, and they, they wanted to make it, I think, they will leave this with COVID. They wanted to make it as easy as possible for the families. They're, the folks out there are disappointed. They wanted this to be a very public event and it would have had a huge attendance, I'm sure. But uh, they, they had to make a decision. They did. So just that morning event, it'll be, I'm sure all the networks will cover it. And it'll be streamed live on the Flight 93, uh, the, the parks website so you'll be able to see that i know i'll be i'll be uh i'll be out there volunteering i'm gonna stay at a hotel out there but i'll watch on tv and then be there that i'm gonna volunteer that afternoon so so basically the memorial is going to be open to the public except for that for the morning of the 11th when they when the ceremony is happening thank you so much tom thank you for sharing your presentation information uh, from your book this evening thank thanks so much thanks for all the questions have a good night you. Um, and everyone, I had another question come in for me about a recording for this. I will be sharing the recording out once I get it edited. Um, so you'll get a follow-up email from me. And thank you again, Tom. And everyone, have a good evening. Thank you.